So I hope that's given enough time for everyone to join us. Um, can I welcome you all to our third In Conversation with the Archivists webinar. Um, I'm Helen Jays, the headmistress of Manchester High, and I'm really delighted to welcome so many of you this evening to our third event. Um, the Manchester High Archive is full of fascinating stories, and so we thought that it would be great to have another opportunity to explore the school's history, especially as we approach our very exciting 150th anniversary next year. But first, let me introduce our two archivists whom some of you will remember either from the last webinar or from your time in school. So Gwen Hobson and Pam Roberts have worked at Manchester High since the 1980s. They shared the running of the Modern Languages Department for many years. In 2008, they became assistant heads. Pam became director of sixth form and Gwen was director of co-curriculum. And in this role, Gwen was responsible for organizing major school events, such as Speech Day and Founders Day, and used the archive extensively to prepare films and presentations on aspects of the school's history. Now, Gwen and Pam both retired as assistant heads in December 2014, but in March 2017, when the school archivist, Dr. Christine Joy, retired, they were asked to take over as part-time archivists as they'd been at the school for so long and knew it so well, and how lucky we were that they accepted that role. We hope that you will enjoy their presentation this evening. Please feel free to ask questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and I will pose as many as I can to them at the end of their presentation. So just type them in as we go along, and I will ask them at the end of the session. So thank you, Gwen and Pam. I will now hand over to you. Well, thank you for inviting us back. Um, this year, we thought that we would do something a little different from in previous years. We've done a lot of research recently in preparation for the school's 150th anniversary next year. We've had to consult the original records going back to 1872 and 1873 when the school was in the planning stages. And the stories that emerge are so fascinating that we thought you might like the chance to see some of the records and the early photographs yourselves. Uh, it does seem a shame to keep them hidden in the archive. Yeah. So we're going to move for a moment from the middle of the, from the mid 1850s back into the 21st century and we're going to share our screen with you. So what has amazed us is that the dream of establishing what was to be the first academic girls school in the north became reality in as little as two years, which is quite an achievement. The planning started in earnest in December 1871 and the school opened in January 1874. So everything happened in 1872 and 1873. The school owes its existence to a group of people who were determined that girls should have the same educational opportunities as boys. They were the Manchester Association for Promoting the Education of Women. Uh, the association was first known as the Manchester Board of School Mistresses, and it organised courses of educational lectures and classes for governesses from 1867 onwards. And they also promoted the Cambridge Higher Local Examinations by offering prizes and paying examination fees for women. These examinations were the forerunners of our A-levels. And so why was this necessary? Well, before the mid 1800s, the educational prospects for women were gloomy. No university admitted them and there were no girls public schools like those for boys. Most middle, uh, middle class girls were educated at home by governesses and although some governesses were well-read women, many lacked the sound education needed to teach others. And although there were some small schools for, schools for girls, they weren't academic and they didn't have the same wide ranging or ambitious curriculum as you would have found in boys public schools of the day. 
It's worth noting at this point that although Manchester had had its own university, first known as Owens College, since 1851, women were not allowed to enrol. It was originally founded for the education of men. So the association was the driving force behind the foundation of Manchester High School for Girls, because without a good secondary education, girls would never be considered good enough to go to university. So the first document that we'd like to show you dates back to December 1871. In 1871, the Manchester Association for Promoting the Education for Women, which is a bit of a mouthful, wrote this report saying, well, has Manchester ever realised even the idea that to give to girls as good opportunities for a thorough education as is given to boys is, to say the least, an experiment worth trying? Girls here have nothing on a par with the Manchester Grammar School. And why should they not have? They concluded... We do very urgently need a school of the highest type for girls, carried on under a public committee of competent governors and at a comparatively inexpensive rate. So we're sorry to say that the, uh, the report that you have in front of you is not the original. Uh, sadly, the minutes of the Manchester Association have been lost, but we are fortunate to have this typewritten transcript um, of the report in our archive. And several points emerge from this. It's clear that the association are setting definite markers. First of all, the school will be of the highest type, i.e. the curriculum will be strongly academic. And secondly, it will be on a par with the Manchester Grammar School, because girls deserve nothing less. The report mentions the stimulus to girls' education provided by the Cambridge local examinations, which in the end gave the girls the qualifications needed to matriculate at university. And then, finally, the school will be led by a public committee of governors so that there'll be external scrutiny of standards. And we know that from the very beginning, the school was ins inspected annually by leading academics whose reports were made public and they were very thoroughgoing. Yeah, they never minced their words. And then the fees will be comparatively inexpensive, which makes the school accessible to a wider range of families. The association then carried out a thorough study of the principles of establishing an academic school for girls. Yes, it has to be said that there weren't many models to follow. The three principal models were in the south of England, uh, Queen's College, Harley Street, North London Collegiate School and Cheltenham Ladies College. This is a modern photo of Queen's College, Harley Street. It was founded in 1848 and offered courses of lectures to girls from 14 upwards. And it was the first institution in England where girls could gain academic qualifications. And as we said, these were the Cambridge local examinations and the forerunners of today's A-levels. Queen's College is important in our history because our very first headmistress, Elizabeth Day, was a pupil and a pupil teacher there. And here we have an early photo of North London Collegiate School. Um, it was founded in 1850 by Frances Mary Buss, and our second headmistress, Sarah Burstall, was a pupil there. And our third model, Cheltenham Ladies College. This was founded in 1853, and we will be talking about the influence on Manchester High of their second headmistress, Miss Dorothea Beale, in a moment. So, back to Manchester High. Having looked at these three schools, in December 1872, the Manchester Association published the first draft scheme for the proposal to establish a model girls school in Manchester. Again, we don't have the original document, but we're lucky to have this transcript. So if you have a look at this first draft scheme, 
there's much in it that we would recognize today. So from the very beginning, the school was to be divided into an elementary or infant department, a junior department and a senior department. And the school year was as it is today, i.e. Div div divided into three terms. And there was some flexibility, you can see in B and C, in the course of instruction to suit the needs of individual pupils. This was necessary at the time when there was no national curriculum as we have today, and the girls had had very varied educational experiences. And as we said just now, um, teaching was to be tested by independent and competent examiners whose reports would be open to everyone. And very importantly, in E, um, the course of instruction had to meet the requirements of the university local examinations so that the girls would have the qualifications to enter university. And the school was open to pupils of all religions and non. Um, religious instruction was provided mm -hmm. if parents or guardians desired it, but it wasn't compulsory. And so this meant that the issue of religious instruction would not be a bar to uh, Jewish families, for example. Yeah, indeed. The intention was that the school, you can see in F, would eventually become self-supporting. But in the first instance, donations were required to meet the expenses of setting up a new school. And a target sum of £3,000 was set but the association wisely also sought guarantees for the next four years. So the association, you can see at the end of this piece of text, invited all who were interested in promoting the better education of the girls of their own city to aid their effort and in the first instance to declare the amounts they were willing to contribute towards establishing the school. So. The next document we'd like to show you is the list of subscribers from 1873. And you can see that the amounts contributed vary from £100 from Mr. Thomas Ashton at the top to one pound, to one guinea rather, or one pound one shilling from Mr. T.D. Ryder at the bottom. And clearly some people gave even smaller sums and they were put together um, and they amounted to um, seven pounds, three shillings. <laughs> this is what makes Manchester High stand out. It was not established by an individual, nor was it a religious foundation. It is the result of the collective will of Manchester citizens. We often say that it was like an early form of crowdfunding. Yes, there's nothing new. And if you look carefully, there are some very well-known Manchester names on this list. Um, the Ashton family, the Barons family, the Gaskells. Miss Gaskell was the daughter of the novelist um, Elizabeth Gaskell. There's Edward Donner, who um, was um, uh, one of our governors. There are people as well from all walks of life. So if you look closely, um, you'll see there are men and women. There are religious figures, there are academics, lawyers, local and national politicians. Yes, you can see MP after uh, Mr. Some James names. Yeah. Yeah. And you um, can also see there are many Jewish families and some of the names um, of those who we would recognise now as our founders that are on the founders board. Yeah. And you can also see that some people have guaranteed money for four years. And in fact, um, once the school committee had reached the total of £2,000, so only two thirds of the target that they'd set in 1873, they started to put their plans into action. The next item we'd like to share with you is the letter written by Miss Dorothea Beale in January 1873 to the Manchester Association. Yes, yeah, so Miss, Miss Beale, she's a giant <laughs> in women's education. She was one of the earliest students at Queen's College in Harley Street. She became the principal of Cheltenham Ladies College, 
and she went on to found St Hilda's College, Oxford. So she had impeccable qualifications uh, and she was the ideal person to advise the association on their project. This is, here is a copy of the first page of her letter. It runs into several pages. As you can see, it's beautiful, but it's quite difficult to decipher quickly in a talk like this. And so to make it easier tonight, we have provided you with um, a typewritten transcript of the entire letter. Yeah, so Miss Beale insists that the school must be self-supporting financially. And she shows a remarkable grasp for the time of the financial management of a school. And she is aware of the problems um, encountered in other schools. She gives detailed advice on the level of fee income and likely expenses, showing the association how they might divide up a fund of £3,000. <laughs> It may seem very simplistic when we compare this with the complex accounting systems of today, but the underlying message is that the school must not get into debt and it must save enough money to be able to plan for the future. Uh, she talks about staffing costs and she talks about staff to pupil ratios and she explains why it costs more to teach older girls because they have more individual tuition. We were particularly struck by this sentence here, um, where she talks about support for those who are not well off on conditions that are consistent with self-respect. And the way that Manchester High was set up reflects her advice. And of course, our bursary scheme has a long tradition and it aims to allow families who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford the fees to send their daughters to the school. So how do we know how the school is set up? We'd now like to show you uh, one of the most valuable items in our collection. We're very fortunate to have bound volumes of Governor's Minutes from 1873, so the year before school was opened, onwards. So these are the minutes of the very first meeting um, of, the, of the subscribers to the Manchester Model Girls School. Um, the first meeting was held in the Mayor's Parlour at Manchester Town Hall on the 23rd of March, 1873, which was less than a year before the school opened. We should point out at this stage that the names of those present are not and who are, and who are listed, they are not the founders that we read out on Founders Day or who are listed on the Founders Board in reception. These are subscribers, the people who got the project off the ground. And as we work through later minutes, we realise that there were many people involved in planning the school. Yeah, there are some names that we would recognise here from the Founders Board. Uh, there's William James Kennedy in the chair, uh, Robert Duckenfield Derbyshire and his wife Harriet Anne Derbyshire and Edward Donner. And it's for this reason that on Founders Day, when we read out the list of principal names, we add and others, our founders and benefactors, to recognise the contribution of the very many people who were involved in setting up the school. On this occasion, the main resolutions were to enter on negotiations with a view to the engagement of a headmistress, to secure suitable premises, and to prepare a definite scheme for the organisation and management of the school. Um, and it's a measure of their commitment uh, that the next meeting is on the 26th of March, three days later. And subsequent meetings follow at very regular intervals. There must be easily two or three a month. At this second meeting, um, the secretary was asked to make inquiries uh, for a headmistress. The salary offered is £200 a year with a capitation fee for pupils after the limit, the first 60. And as you can see, um, one of the first people they wanted to consult about this was Miss Emily Davies. Uh, Emily Davies had just founded Hitchin College in 1869, 
and this became Burton College, Cambridge, and was the first residential women's college. We should, at this point, perhaps say a little bit more about our links with Girton College. Yes, this group photo shows the first three students at Girton. Um, they were known as the Girton Pioneers, and their names were Sarah Woodhead, who circled um, top left, Rachel Cook, who's in the centre at the bottom, and Louisa Lumsden, who circled on the far right. The governors had hoped to appoint Louisa Lumsden as headmistress, but she had already accepted the post of tutor at Girton and was therefore unavailable. However, yes, Sarah Woodhead was appointed as the school's first mathematics mistress. And this struck a blow against the very strong prejudice felt at the time about teaching mathematics to girls. It was considered too dangerous for their pretty little heads. So we're now showing you the letter of recommendation for Sarah Woodhead, which was sent uh, to the committee by Emily Davies. Uh, we're showing you here the first page of her letter and the transcript, because again, the handwriting is quite difficult to uh, decipher at speed. What is most interesting is the fact that Emily Davis makes it clear that although Sarah Woodhead had reached the required standard for second class honours in the mathematical tripos, she was not allowed by the university to take her degree because she was a woman. And so Miss Davies stresses that she must say nothing, which implies that the certificate was given by the university examiners. And she concludes, For the present, we are obliged to be satisfied with an unofficial guarantee of the standard, the college, not the university, giving the certificate. So this letter is one of the real treasures of our archive. And it illustrates very clearly the prejudice against women's education. And in fact, women weren't allowed to graduate from Cambridge until 1948, which is only six years before we were born. They were very last century. <laughs> That's quite scary. It is very scary. And although um, other universities did allow women to graduate sooner than, than that, it was very often after a battle. The third, uh, Girton pioneer, Rachel Cook, became one of our governors, in fact. She served on the governing body from 1875 to 1884 and was married to C.P. Scott, who was the editor of the Manchester Guardian, and he himself was a governor from 1875 to 1888. So Manchester High had close links with all the major pioneering institutions in terms of women's education. So now, going back to the question of finding a headmistress, it's clear from the minutes from the 5th of May 1873 that the, the committee had received a number of applications from women keen to become headmistress. But the committee weren't prepared to lower their standards after being turned down by Miss Lumsden of Girton College. By July 1873, um, from where we take these minutes, they, um, they had considered the testimonials of several candidates, they'd had interviews with them, and the re committee records that uh, Miss Elizabeth Day is the most highly qualified among them. She had excelled academically at Queen's College, Harley Street, where she'd been both a pupil and a pupil teacher. And the committee were impressed by her first class Cambridge certificate. We know that she passed with distinction in divinity, English literature, French, Italian and Greek. But no university degree. Our first headmistress no. had no university degree. And we love the tale told by Sarah Burstall, who is the school's second headmistress, in her book, uh, The Story of the Manchester High School for Girls. She reports that Miss Day was reluctant to leave London at first, and she has had an unfortunate experience at a previous interview where she was told that she was too young and would probably marry and her husband might turn out a scamp and get at the funds through her. 
she was reassured that nothing like this would be said to her, and she agreed to come for interview in July 1873. She stayed with two of our founders, Mr. and Mrs. Derbyshire in Victoria Park, and was pleasantly surprised to see trees and hear a thrush singing. She had had thought that Manchester had no such joys. So Manchester High had its first headmistress and she was only 29 years old. Uh, we know that she was to be given rooms in the school for her accommodation and a weekly allowance of 10 shillings for each servant employed. The servants would cook and clean for the whole school, as well as looking after Miss Day and the two other members of staff who were living in. So, if by July 1873 we had a headmistress, we still had no premises and a final decision had to be made on the name of the school. In the story of the Manchester High School for Girls, Sara Burstall describes the decision making process. The school was originally called um, a model school for girls, but the minutes of the committee show that by June the 9th, 1873, the name had been changed um, to the Manchester Public Day School for school, uh, Girls. And then when Miss Day was appointed, it was considered that the use of this name might cause confusion with hers and that it might be thought to be Miss Day School. So in the end, the name became the Manchester High School for Girls and the name was modelled on the Edinburgh High School, which was a boys' school attended by, amongst others, Sir Walter Scott. The question of premises proved to be quite difficult to resolve. The committee looked at various locations. The search began in early 1873, but it wasn't until September the 30th, only four months before opening, that the school committee confirmed that they were going to rent two houses. These were numbers 369 and 371 Portland Terrace on Oxford Road on a seven year lease. Yes, the houses no longer exist, but today the University Medical School stands on that site. And if you look carefully um, on, on the screen, the minutes suggest that Edward Donner, the treasurer, paid for the lease himself in the first instance and had to be reimbursed. Um, Sarah Burstall describes in detail in her book uh, the advantages of the site chosen on Oxford Road. And she says, it is interesting to consider why the school was placed in Oxford Road. Scarce a stone's throw from the site of the permanent building. This is a reference to Dover Street, the second home. Yeah. That district was already beginning to be what Professor Sadler calls it today. I'm going to hand over to you for the best yes, pronunciation. Yes, the, the, the Quartier Latin of Manchester. Yeah, as we've seen, the, the college had moved there. She, here she's talking about Owens College, i.e. the university um, on Oxford Road. And directories show that the doctors and other professional men had already come out from the centre of the city. Medical men had lived around Piccadilly, but at this time, Ardwick Green, which was then like a London square, and Oxford Road had become the favoured spots. Uh, teachers of music had collected in the district between St Peter's Church on Oxford Road and Nelson Street. And the Schiller Anstalt occupied a house near the college. Just beyond the houses taken by the school lay a very good residential district with large houses and fine old trees onto Victoria Park, which is described in a local guide of 1874 as one of the pleasantest localities in the environs of Manchester. So the school began in the ideal location to attract the sort of families who might want their daughters to have an academic education. But a lot of work needed to be done to convert the houses into a school. First, it was necessary to strengthen floors and to knock through walls to convert rooms into classrooms. They provided two cloakrooms, a dining room and a committee room for governor's meet meetings. So here are the minutes for December the 6th, 1873, which show that the committee were sending uh, Mr Donner and Mr Derbyshire to the town hall with a view to prevailing on the corporation to make better terms as to the water supply. 
They also had long discussions about the type of desks to buy and whether the girls would need lockers. And in the end, they rejected desks manufactured in London in favour of desks manufactured locally at a cost of 22 shillings per desk. Both cloakrooms um, had 48 numbered coat hooks and this being Manchester, several umbrella stands were bought. And we know that um, the long narrow gardens behind the houses were asphalted as playgrounds, some swings were put up and a large wooden shed was built where the girls could play during bad weather. But the committee were hard up against the clock. On, 80, on Christmas Eve 1873, mm. Edward Donner had to go back to the town hall about the gas meter. And this slide shows that on January the 12th, 1874, so only one week before the school opened on uh, January the 19th, discussions are still going on about quite important issues. Um, firstly, they haven't been able to settle the scheme of teaching. And it's also interesting that there are candidates for entry between the ages of six and eight who are not able to write to read fluently and to write fairly. So special provision has to be made for them and they have to enter the elementary or infant department. Moving on, um, the school committee also discussed uh, the purchase of a Broadwood pianette at £24.10 shillings and a Kirkman piano at a cost of £42 for music lessons. And they sought advice from Mr Hecht, who was the choir master of the Halle, and he later served as, an, as inspector of music at, at the school. It's frightening, if we look at point five, um, to see that they're just approving a circular to make known to the parents the opening of the school with only seven days to go. But point six shows that they had at least finalised the catering arrangements. Uh, Mrs de Chastelaine was to supply dinners at one shilling and one penny, and servants' dinners were to cost eightpence. The next page shows that at that same meeting on January the 12th, they're talking about finalising finalizing the <laughs> rules and regulations which are to be adopted on January the 17th, two days before opening. And Miss Day is authorised to purchase maps and slates for immediate use. So they were certainly going up to the wire. And we wondered how confident were the governors that parents would want to send their daughters to the new school. And it was a bit nail biting. They must have had some sleepless nights because they'd made a huge commitment, both financially and emotionally. Uh, they believed passionately in their cause, but they couldn't be sure that enough people would share their vision. There was therefore an advertising campaign. Uh, nothing is new here. We didn't invent marketing. So in November 1873, with only two months to go before the school was due to open, the secretary was directed to advertise once a week in three daily papers in Manchester. And incidentally, if you look at um, the bottom, uh, it was also agreed that Miss Day should visit Cheltenham Ladies College to acquaint herself with the system of teaching there. And the headmistress was involved in the publicity campaign, uh, sending out prospectuses and forms of application, as well as calling on ladies who'd already agreed to send their daughters to the high school. Here is the application form from one of the very first pupil, Frances, or Fanny, Harrison. She remembers being summoned from the nursery when Miss Day came to visit and recalls the awe with which she looked on the new headmistress, who was probably just as nervous as herself. Uh, and you can see from this application form that she lived in Ardwick Green uh, and that her father was a surgeon. What's significant is that she had been educated at home, it says private tuition, up to the age of 13. She's applying at the age of 13. By the way, Frances Harrison is a legend at Manchester High. Um, the Harrison Lawn, 
which you will remember, some of you, uh, in front of the East and Sea Wings at Grangethorpe Road is named after her. She became a teacher at the school and went on to be head of the prep department. And she was the one who, uh, after she retired, used to send ivy leaves by train from her garden in Sussex for Founders Day. Uh, some of you might remember wearing an ivy leaf for Founders Day, and we know that some girls actually still remember meeting her yeah. in school. Despite the advertising campaign, by the time that the two houses had been taken, only five pupils had been promised. Yes, and Sarah Burstall in her book writes that some of the committee felt hesitation and alarm, but others, including the treasurer, Edward Donner, were quite ready to go on and trust the common sense of the Manchester parent who knows a good article when he sees it. One of our founders, Harriet Ann Derbyshire, clearly helped to make the school very attractive. Sarah Burstall reports that Mrs Derbyshire was the soul of practical managing wisdom and common sense and rendered great service to the school as a member of the House Committee, which devoted a great deal of thought and time and trouble to the furnishing and arranging of the Oxford Road houses for classrooms and dwelling rooms preparatory to the opening of the school. And if you look at, look at the top, this extract from Sarah Burstall's book is also the source of our information about Miss Day's visit to Fanny Harrison's mother and um, the story of her being summoned in haste from the nursery. In the end, as we know, everything worked out. 60 girls were enrolled on the first day, parents simply poured in, and the secretary, Miss Vernon, remembers that she had to get a handsome cab to take to the bank the heavy weight of gold that had been brought in as fees. So, we've talked about the staff and the premises and the advertising campaign to recruit pupils, but what about the all important curriculum? In the minutes for October the 15th, 1873, there's an attachment which includes a draft school prospectus. And in accordance with their original determination that the curriculum would be academic and wide ranging, the subjects listed in the school course of instruction, as you can see, were English grammar, language and literature, history, geography, arithmetic, algebra, geometry, French, German, Latin, calisthenics, drawing, plain sewing, class singing and harmony. We should explain calisthenics to the modern audience. It was an early form of PE and consisted of gymnastic exercises to achieve fitness and grace of movement. It's, like a, it's a form of drill. And the inclusion of algebra, geometry and Latin proved that Manchester High School girls would receive an education equal to that found in leading boys' schools. What is interesting is the emphasis placed on determining the particular course of instruction for each scholar, having regard to her health, ability and attainments. We would recognise this as good pedagogical practice today when the needs of the individual are paramount. But at the time, this was also a very practical consideration because the pupils who entered the school on the first day had had such a varied educational experience beforehand and they weren't at, at all at the same standard. You can see under the heading examination that there will be an entrance examination for every scholar. The first entrance examination, however, turned out to be more of a fact-finding mission to establish how much each girl knew. And they were then put into classes, not according to age at this point, but according to the level that they had reached. And while we're on this page, we should look at the fees. Uh, so they're four guineas or four pounds, four shillings for girls under 14 and five guineas or five pounds, five shillings for girls over 14 per term. The sharp eyed amongst you will have noticed that there is no dreaded uniform list. That is because there was no uniform until much later. Yes, uniforms were associated at that time with schools for the poor. So parents would have been very reluctant to consider 
a uniform. So as we draw our talk to a close, we wanted to come out of... Uh, well, we know we want to look at the photo. Yes, we? yeah. We wanted to finish with this photo. It's mm. slightly out of period, but mm. we couldn't resist. Yes. This is the first photo um, from our collection, and it shows the Manchester High staff in 1878. Miss Day is here at the centre. And we look at this photo with fascination. Yeah, it's a it's a brilliant photo, and we're, we're, it's the costumes that are so fascinating. They're so trussed up. Um, how on earth did they move or even breathe? That's that's what we we ask ourselves all the time. So we're going to. We hope you enjoyed our uh, gamble really through. Um, the through the, the race to get the school um, open. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen now and hand back to Mrs Jays um, for uh, questions. Yes, you may catch us out. <clears throat> if we can't answer questions tonight, we'll do our homework and we'll try and send out replies um, if we can tomorrow or early next week. We hope that we've whetted your appetite for the anniversary celebrations. And above all, we hope that we've made you feel very proud to be part of the Manchester High community. Uh, certainly, we were very proud to teach here and working in the archive is a huge privilege. It is a remarkable school. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, everybody, please do um, continue to ask questions if you have any. Um, just to start off, I found Dorothea Beale's letter absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah particularly in terms of how much she says still underpins current practice, which I know. Yes, guess that's really. right. Yeah. Do you have any records? I'm asking you without any kind of notice this question. Do you have any records of those who joined the school who couldn't afford full fees? You know, have you got anything about those initial students who couldn't afford full fees and what happened to them? Um, we know that um, at the very beginning, more or less from day one, there was a, a scholarship for daughters of, of the clergy, cl the clergy, and it wasn't too long after that that um, uh, I, I guess you call them bursaries were set up. I mean, I can't I can't remember the exact dates, and that's something that we were planning to talk about um, next year. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it really it wasn't too long before um, there was remittance of fees um, and the, the governor's minutes are full of um, mentions of, of, of families who, 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 whose um, fees are, are, are um, uh, cancelled. Mm. They don't have to pay fees. Yes. Yeah, so um, and we do have um, we have the the, the, the the admission form that we showed you uh, for Fanny Harrison. We have one of those for every every girl yeah. um, uh, until that system was abolished. So we have many bound volumes and there, there's quite a lot of detail mm. penciled in. Um, so we showed you the admissions form. And then on the other side, there is details about the academic mm. progress and other bits and pieces. And yeah. that's something that we would we would physically need to to work through each yeah because sometimes they, they, they it refers to whether or not fees were paid yeah so yes it is something that we can we should it's possible we should look at i'll make a note of that um that we need to look at um yeah remission of fees yeah it did and happen really, and then and then trusts were set up i mean um school had money from the hume trust yes um, and uh, relatively quickly. Um, but yeah, this is a, top, a big topic in itself. Yeah. Uh, it's certainly worth looking at, yes. Yeah. And what's interesting is some of that language governors still use now. And that's yeah. fascinating that the, you know, the language about that foundation, we still refer to now. And absolutely, to absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, we're constantly struck by the fact that, um, you know, nothing changes. Nothing mm. has really changed from the, the first the first day from the planning stages the well the, because the, it was the sound yeah it was very sound at the time i mean we we, we are just in awe of the, the 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 vision that these people had um and the um the the wisdom that they showed in, yeah. in the way they set up the school to make it so prepared for the future mm. um, it is it it was an amazing achievement yeah and and how, how nail biting it was as you said yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's right. Very, very nail biting. <laughs> yes, you, you, you'd hope that it wouldn't be like that now. No. 
<laughs> Absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. Um, I will go to some questions in a, in, a, in a while, but what's interesting is that so much of the information that you talk about is from Sarah Burstall. Um, yes. Do we have much directly from Elizabeth Day? And uh, what no. do you think was her greatest contribution as the first head? As, a, as the first head? Well, I guess it was... Um, she was a brilliant teacher. She was, yeah. She was the, the, the. She was an inspiration. She was an inspirational teacher. Sarah Burstall talks a lot about um, about that in in her book. This this is it. Uh, Sarah Burstall's book. The um, you can't see it very well, but the story, the story of, of the Manchester High School for Girls. And um, yeah, she talks a lot about Elizabeth Day in there. I, I think it was. Um, I think she was a she was a very good role model, certainly. Um, and um, I think she she had to cope with really difficult circumstances. As we said, um, she had um, the first cohort of girls and, and the situation will have lasted for quite some time um, who were all at different standards. And how on earth do you cope with that kind of situation and the way they managed to organize the scheme of instruction? Um, to make sure that girls have the sort of teaching that they needed. Um, pretty quickly. Pretty actual, quickly. Pretty yes. quickly. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the reports, the 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 the, um, the teaching and learning in, in modern terms, mm -hmm. the teaching and learning was um, inspected and assessed mm -hmm. and a, a very detailed report was written. Yeah. Um, and those were sent, the reports were sent out to parents and we have them all. Mm. And if you look at those reports, you can see that there is a steady improvement yeah. in the quality of teaching and learning yeah. as they get on top of yes. the situation. I mean, they, they do take those inspection reports very, very seriously. So I think she was a very serious woman. She did take it very seriously. And um, but I think you're absolutely right. I think I think she was an inspirational teacher herself. Mm. And when you consider her age. 29 yeah. yeah you know she had never she had never had the experience didn't have the experience they didn't have the the courses for head teachers that you know we have today nothing of that sort she didn't work her way way up from the bottom mm. it was quite a leap wow amazing, amazing. Yeah. um i've got lots more but i'm going to go to the the q a um marie Giraud, i remember hi marie lovely to hi, 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 hi marie <laughs> um the photo is reminiscent of the Royal Academy of Art. It's a classic trope celebrating the founding members. Wonderful visual work. Absolutely so. Yes. Yes. The Royal Society. The Royal Academy of Art, she says. Oh, right. OK. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. Um, Helen Hackett, wonderful talk, thank you. In her fascinating novel, Bodies of Light, Sarah Moss suggests that the drive for women's education in Victoria and Manchester was partly driven by a desire for women to have female doctors. Is there any evidence of this thinking in the MHSG archives? Well, oh, well, well yes. <laughs> yes, indeed, because... Um, well, the two first... The, the two first... The two first um, women to um, graduate in medicine from Manchester University. One was a an one was, o, one an was old an old girl, girl um, Catherine, Catherine Corbett. Corbett. She was an old girl, and the other was Catherine Chisholm, who became the, the school doctor. I mean, I think I think um, in the early days of of women in medicine, um, I think men were quite reluctant. Uh, to be treated by women and so very often they were uh, women doctors were um, directed towards um, treating babies and women and in fact Catherine, um, Catherine Chisholm, Chisholm set, up set up the Manchester Babies Hospital, Hospital was one of the founders of the Manchester Babies Hospital which I guess became St Mary's yeah um, and um, so so yes yes I mean they I, I think I think medicine was probably um, on their minds. But, but if you look at um, the records from the First World War, yeah. um, there are a number of girls who, who don't go into medicine directly, they go into medicine through nursing and having had experience in yeah. field hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, so Nesta Perry, who became the first female police surgeon, mm -hmm. she entered yes. via that, yeah. that route. Yeah. Um, and again, that's something that it would be very interesting for us to explore. There is, we, we, we should send it out, there is, we have a very interesting book about turning to our small collection <laughs> excuse me for one minute 
uh, we have a book about. Oh, I don't know oh, right. find it's it. Endell Street. It's called Endell Street. Here it is. Yeah. Endell Street. Uh, and this is actually a very interesting. Can you can you see that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Endell Street. We can we can. It, um, it talks about the women blazing a trail because initially, when they wanted to, um, um, because they they were not allowed to go into medicine here. They but they were deployed through um, I think the Scottish division that it, sent. Well, into, uh, they were sent into military hospitals. Military so hospitals. This, this this book talks about Louisa Garrett Anderson and and um, uh, early women doctors in London. So it's very very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Good book. But again, the link between Manchester High and, you know, significant yeah. hosp local hospitals that are yeah. national. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that. There's, um, I was going to actually ask you this, and it's about the um, reference to religious instruction in the curriculum mm -hmm. and how it's delivered in the afternoon. But it's interesting. There's a kind of implication that you could withdraw from religious instruction, yeah. which is quite interesting because, you know, similar things now. Um, but one question is... Um, Religious instruction will be delivered in the afternoon as it seems to have been needed for university applications. Yes, I think you needed it to matriculate. You, you, uh, it was a subject that you needed to matriculate. I think that was why. Yeah. yeah. And is that similar to the maths? I like the idea that maths is dangerous. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Like maths, maths was, <laughs> was considered. Well, I mean, education generally, um, an academic education for, for, for girls was considered by many people um in the 19th century to be to be dangerous for them physically and mentally um, or you don't want to turn your daughter into a blue into a sort of blue, a stocking. blue stocking yes that was uh, the because, ultimate insult um mm. so that and um, and the other thing is i mean in terms of science science teaching was quite controversial in the early days mm -hmm. botany was quite safe biology mm, mm, not, not so, so good mm. no, you might be touching <laughs> on areas that girls shouldn't know anything about uh, it was dodgy and yeah. I we were one of the first schools girls schools to teach physics seriously yeah so um, and chemistry and chemistry so mm. they, they were they were going in for hard science and hard maths and yeah. if you look at um in 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 our the, the early girls going through a lot of them were that did go on to do mathematics it yes was, they did Yes, it was a it was a, a, a quite a popular subject. And Sarah Burstall herself was a mathematician. And we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it more next year when we go into the beginnings of the school. Um, but you know, some of the some of the women, who, the, the first women to uh, graduate in science at Manchester University were Manchester High girls. Yeah, fascinating. Not just medicine. Yeah. Um, one of our governors asks about the relationship with Manchester Grammar School because obviously Manchester Grammar School is referred to a lot in terms of comparison mm. right at the mm. start. Um, what was the relationship with Manchester Grammar? Was there a relationship? And were any of our founders and subscribers patrons of MGS? Was there any link with the High well, that's, a, that's a very interesting uh, yes, question. I, I think so. I'm not sure that they were... I mean, I mean, later on, certainly, there, there, were, there were definitely links with, with Manchester Grammar. I mean, we had um, debating, we had, we had um, inter-school debates um that they were quite um they were very popular weren't they um but certainly yes i think subscribers it it was actually a very small well not very small it was quite a large um group of people who were um contributing money to um all kinds of philanthropic um acts in in manchester in manchester we've just been um we just had a researcher into the archive mm. um, who is doing a PhD on the two music schools which were fused to become the Royal Northern College of Music. And she was looking at, so she's been working through exactly the same papers that we've been working mm. through to prepare this talk and looking at the names that are in common. And we were chatting to her about it because you learn a great deal from researchers. And she said that the same names crop up so donna derbyshire the barons they are the ansons they are they are donating money to the music college yeah um and um well and there are other things like the Lit 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 literary and philosophical Bill, society the in manchester the whitworth um and it's the same people the same names come up again and again and again and certainly um, I th I think we will we will have had um, governors in common. I, I mean I, I need to check that with the archivist at um, Manchester Ground, but I think I think we did have 
certainly, yes. And they all mixed with one They all another. mixed, yes, yeah. it was quite a... Um, it must be quite heady, it actually. It must have been, If yes. you could be teleported back, yes. <laughs> it would be quite interesting to just see what it they must all have been met. like. I mean, we know from um, obituaries, they all met at the same funerals. Um, you know, their names are listed. So, yes, they did know and each other. There are a lot of, it occurred to me cause as a journalist, that there are a lot of German names floating around. Um, and there was a huge German, the, the, the German community was the, the largest foreign community in Manchester at the time and the reference that we made to the Schiller Anstalt this was a, like um, a, 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 a club where they would meet um, and again that is a source that the Schiller Anstalt and the Gaskells had a sort of salon they had salon yes that's for right yeah. the sort of the great and good and they would all the the the, the, the musical life of the city um, the sort of intellectual life, mm -hmm. they were all mixing with one yeah. another. Mm. So, and contributing, contributing to various phil um, philanthropic um, schemes. schemes. So it must yeah. have been a really fantastic time. Mm. Yeah. And the impact they had on so many yeah. areas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, okay. We've had a, a couple others that have just flown through. Another one from Marie, which I like very much. Um, do the reports shed any light on discipline and disruptive behaviour and how it might have been managed? Well, I mean, we've been looking in particular this time at the, at the planning rather than the, uh, uh, the execution uh, later in, in, after 1874. So, um, yes, the minutes do refer, later, later minutes when the school is open, they do refer to misdemeanours and the odd expulsion. And, and we have as well... Um, at, at some point there must have been a, a boarding house yes. for girls who came from too far away and a couple of the girls have written the boarding house chronicle and in that little booklet that they they, they, they describe the album the, yeah the jolly japes that they got yes, to. Oh, <laughs> yes it's, it's really good good fun we, we have to talk about that next, next year. year yeah excellent excellent yeah. we do have somebody who said um the 20th century post-war generation M mhsg did not have the same connection i think we're talking about the connection with mgs in the late 1960s we did very little with mgs but suddenly they started playing hockey matches with us Gosh, even tossing girls over with a hockey stick. Um, <laughs> it was followed by a move towards renewal of connection. No mixing was allowed. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. um, I really like this question. Thank you. Um, another Helen and a very pertinent question since I'm a Helen. Um, I was involved in the centenary of MHSG celebrations and was asked to find the most popular first names over the last 100 years. Yes. Interestingly, yeah. Helen appeared in every decade. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering if this is still the case and how many Helens there were in the first intake of pupils. Selfishly, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, well, actually, the, the, the she's absolutely right. I mean, the the um, there was a, a book, a booklet produced um, for uh, to celebrate the uh, the centenary. Um, and in it, there, there is an, an analysis of first names. I mean, I can't tell you off the top of my head what <laughs> the most common names were, but certainly it is in there. And it's maybe something that we should consider well, doing. We, we wondered whether that one might be quite a fun project for mm. prep because we can actually, yeah. yes, we, uh, we, 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 we can, we we can got, provide that from our database. And it yes. would be quite interesting for them to work out. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We should uh, ask the girls to do that. That's a great idea. I yeah. think that's yes. yeah. And they'd love that. They'd really, yes. really love to be yes. involved. Yes, yeah. um, a, a few other questions, if that's okay. That's fine. And the uniform, you mentioned uniform. When mm -hmm. actually did that come in then? Oh, oh. uniform. Yes. Right. Well, it, it, the as early as you might think. think um, uniform, at th that stage, uniform was associated to, uh, with, with, in the 1870s. With charity schools. With charity schools, yeah. ragged schools, people who were too poor to clothe their own children. So the kind of people that they were targeting would not have wanted children to wear uniform mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it would have sent out the wrong messages. What they did have was um, a yellow um, silk scarf. It's a sash, sash. A sash that they wore. Um, across their bosoms, um, yellow silk sash. against white. Yes, they wore they wore these sashes on um, speech night and on ceremonial occasions. And actually, we have one in the archive. We, we have, have one of the we have two. Sorry, we have two sashes in the archive, um, and they wore those. Um, I think in the eighteen from the eighteen eighties. Yeah. Um, 
the they tried and there's uh, uh sarah bursell describes having uh tried to trying to introduce a hat band and a hat <laughs> and that met with stiff opposition from mothers at first yes at first yeah no way mm -hmm. um and so the gradually that came in it did, about, it about did. 19 that was about 1899 i think yeah right at the end of the century mm -hmm. and then because um gym tunics were uh quite comfortable the girls i think pushed to wear gym tunics in school instead of those victorian garments which must have been absolute yeah. hell to move around yeah. in and so gym slips yeah came in as a uniform in that way mm -hmm. and that we've had somebody doing research um mm -hmm. on a phd on school uniform uh, and she said yeah that is that's the that that pattern is matched in in yeah. many girls mm -hmm. school that it comes in through sport yeah gosh yeah fascinating yes um we've had uh, you have to forgive the pronunciation um was there a link between the schiller anstalt and the goethe institute in manchester I remember being recommended to visit the latter by my German teacher in the 1970s. Yeah, I mean, the Goethe Institute came in later. That that was that's a German government. It's a German government it's organization. Like the British Council. Mm -hmm. um, and that was established in, um, and I can remember um, that coming in, it's probably in the 1960s. Um, the Schiller Anstalt was um, a, a club on its own. It was set up by, by the, 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 the German emigre living in, in that area. Um, and I, I don't know when it, it, it finished. This is something which suddenly, you know, working on this, it made, mm. it made me quite interested. Um, so I don't know when the Schiller Anstalt find that out, yeah. stopped. The Goethe Institute, I think, is in the sort of late 60s, probably in manchester so i i don't know if there's a connection um but i know that goethe institute is like british council's government funded body schiller anstalt was uh just a group of people who got mm -hmm. together and they had rooms mm -hmm. but they, it was quite close to the university mm -hmm. okay um there's another comment here on mgs um the thursday singers which obviously still exists now the joint with mm -hmm. um choir with mgs and withington um so one person has said the thursday singers in which i was a soprano 1971 to 73 began in the late 60s one of the few joint ventures with mgs there was also schools in concert with mgs perhaps 1972 in mm -hmm. which we performed together our man in havana <laughs> and beyond the unknown region malcolm arnold fascinating <laughs> insight this is what i love about these q a yes. questions you yes. get all these yeah. tips. yes yeah. um I, and I, you probably will talk about this next year, and you've talked a lot about this anyway this evening. Um, we've got one question about, do we know much more about that first cohort of pupils that went through? Um, you yes, we do. yes, we do. Yes, we do. And we don't, we don't, it's a bit of a spoiler, really. We don't want to talk too much about that tonight because we want to keep it for next year. But yes, yeah. we do know what happened to quite a few of them, and some of them did remarkable things. Yeah. Um, so, yes, it's an interest. It, it's a very interesting um, topic. So yeah. we, we will talk about it, but we don't want to, we don't want to do it all <laughs> tonight. We want to keep some for next year. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, both we're all very, very excited about celebrations next year and the 150th and what it means, um, you know, for our pupils now. You know, we talked about exploring the past and really looking forward to what the future might look like for our pioneering school. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk a little bit about how the archive and how you're going to? enable the archive to form part of those really important celebrations. What are you doing now in the archive in preparation for next year? Well, um, we, we, have, we have we have quite a few. I don't know how much you how far you want us to go with disclosing. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that we we, we are very aware of this. We have a very rich and interesting collection, mm. but it's quite difficult to share it. Mm. Uh, and so we have commissioned um, or school has commissioned um, a, a new platform um, which will make it easier to access material um, and we are going to get our own blog 
on that platform, which will be fun. Mm -hmm. But it will also enable us to do things like um, scan uh, the long, they're known in the trade as the curly whirlies, the long school photographs, <laughs> but it, it, with 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 um, a, a, a layer on the top so that you'd be able to zoom in to the faces, which mm -hmm. we think would be quite nice for people to have a little trip down memory lane. Yeah. Um, and uh, we also, well, we have various projects. I mean, we, we do, we want to try and get it, get, get the girls interested in their yeah. history as well. So we've done a pilot project this year with year eight um, in um, conjunction with the his history department. And um, the girls have been given um, an early um, pupil or, or, or a pupil of some renown, obviously deceased because we don't want to contravene data protection laws. Um, and they've done some research using our digital archive, because we have quite a lot of material already scanned. So they've used the digital archive and material which we have provided to find out about the individual they've been they've been given and then to write a, a profile of them so that they can you know they, they 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 can see what sort of remarkable people the school has um turned out um and so th this we have done for the first time this year and we are hoping to repeat the um uh the project next year maybe on a, a slightly larger scale so that the girls can get involved in in the in the archive too and that yeah. that, that, that that's great fun yeah yeah Brilliant. I mean, there is so That's much. Fun I mean, there are there are there are lots yeah. of things. There are lots of things that we want to do. I mean, obviously, we will produce um, various um, publications about the history of the school, but more of that later. Yeah, yeah. Lots to look forward to, and yeah. hopefully, everybody on the call now will be involved in some capacity. Well, and, and things like the walking tour, the walking tour that we do, and, and probably another webinar next year. Mm -hmm. So, for those people who can't get in to various events, we, we will. You know, we and we're, we're constantly making films and 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 um, so forth and doing ex making exhibitions about various aspects of school's history, which we we can upload to our digital um, archives and also onto the school website. So it gets out there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that your archive videos, I think, are the most accessed part of our YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting a following. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the problem is, Gwen and Pam, I could talk to you all evening. That's the problem. Um, <laughs> and I am aware that at some point I am going to have to stop this session. <laughs> um, but we've got so much to look forward to next year. We can't wait. Um, but can I just thank everyone for being here this evening, for listening to um, what Gwen and Pam have got to say. And the session has been recorded and we will send it out soon and um, we hope that you've enjoyed it and we also hope that you will join us as I've said for the events that we have planned for later this year and during our anniversary year um, and thank you Gwen and Pam for everything that you're doing you're producing so much research and giving us such fantastic insight into the history of our amazing pioneering school. So thank you so much for this evening for everything you're doing um, to entertain us and for, you know, talking to us about the history of girls' education and, and the school just contributes so much to that history. So thank you so much. And thank you everybody it's a pleasure. for being here this evening. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.